Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Test Row channel. Now, as you know, I love steampunk. And although there are a lot of books out there, there's never enough video. There's never enough movies and series and so on. One place that there is a fair bit is anime. And that may be because the Japanese put out so much of it. And it's fun. There are many, several uh, Japanese steampunk related series and historical series from that time but most of them take place either in a fantasy world in the far future or in America or Europe very few take place in actual Japan which is kind of a shame because Japan had its own age of steam which we call the Meiji restoration so I thought my viewers be interested in a little summary a little explanation of what the Japanese Age of Steam was. And what was the Meiji Restoration? Why do we call it that? And why is it important? Before I get into talking about the Meiji Restoration, I want to explain a little bit more what I mean, how the anime don't really happen in Japan, most of them. I mean, we have great ones like Last Exile, which is one of my favorites, which I reviewed, but it's a fantasy world. Uh, same with uh, Drifting Dragons, another great one. Uh, same with uh, Howl's Moving Castle, <laughs> and so on. Now, there are a few. One is called Cabinary of the Iron Fortress, which is about a zombie apocalypse. And they are escaping on a steam locomotive, <laughs> steam-powered train. Another is Mars Red, which is about a vampire plague, and I am rewatching that right now. A third that is not really steampunk, but uh, definitely an interesting fantasy is the very popular Demon Slayer. Yes, it takes place in the very early 20th century, perhaps in the Meiji era, perhaps in the Taisho era, which kind of followed right after it and was a lot the same, much like that. If you've seen any of these, you have a little bit of an idea what I'm talking about. Now, why the term Meiji Restoration? Meiji is a Japanese word that means enlightened rule. And by restoration, we mean the restoration of imperial power. Because Japan's had an emperor as long as anybody can remember, as long as recorded history. I mean, the current one is probably like a, the 128th or, or something like that. <laughs> but for quite some time the emperor had no power he was a figurehead and the real ruler was called the shogun and he was a military dictator more or less and the actual uh, actual dynasty that ruled japan for quite some time was not the emperor's dynasty it was the tokugawa's the tokugawa shogunate and way back in the 1600s, uh, the first Tokugawa said, I'm going to cut off Japan from the world. No more foreign influence. Any Jap Japanese person from now on who goes and comes back is going to be put to death. And any foreigners who come into our country are going to be put to death. <laughs> so we're going to be off by ourselves. And so that's the situation it was when it suddenly was opened up in the 1800s. Now, my references here, I've got some interesting books. Not enough of this, not enough literature and so on from this era. And in fact, I ended up reading two books by the same guy, Mark Ravina, who is obviously a scholar of Japan uh, from the name, a Westerner, but knows a lot about Japan and can explain it to us uh, uninitiated Americans. First is The Last Samurai, The Life and Battles of Ta Saigo Takamori. And he was kind of a tragic figure, but he's considered a national hero, the Japanese. Uh, this was written in 2003, published by Wiley. And it was the loose inspiration for a movie called The Last Samurai. And I believe it starred Tom Cruise because, of course, you can't just have Japanese in a movie about Japan. You have to have an American in there so that we would be interested, right? <laughs> Second Ravina book is to stand with the nations of the world which is a more a general overview of that time. Uh, it's how, 
how it came about and uh, what happened during that time. And uh, whereas the life of Saigo is more specific because he was an important fi figure in the transition. Now, third one is very different. It is called Sad Toys Romaji Diary. <laughs> this is by a poet uh, named Ishigawa Takaboku. Uh, it was translated and uh, the version I read was published in 2011, but the actual thing was written 100 years before. Uh, Ishikawa, he was kind of a tragic figure again. Uh, he died young of tuberculosis, and he was the star of the anime Woodpecker Detective's Office, which I also recently reviewed. And this book is his, his diary and his poems, which give a very interesting look into everyday life in late Meiji era Japan. And there's a very good biography. I think it was probably written by one of the translators. I'll put that up, which I forget right now, but I'll put it up on the slide when I show the book. Now, who was the Meiji Emperor? Well, he was a guy named Mutsuhito. And the reason they called it Meiji, because they didn't name it after the person, they named it after the theme. <laughs> the theme that the emperor himself chose. He was born in 1852, and he reigned from 1867 to 1912. That's 45 years. Why so long? Because he started really young. You know, his successor died when he was a teenager and put him on the throne. Much like, much like our beloved, the steampunks, our beloved Queen Victoria, who also took the throne as a girl. And she reigned for 64 years. So there's a lot of interesting parallels here. Both had uh, a countries who were going through great change and uh, technical revolutions and so on. They were popular. Both were very popular. And they were kind of symbolic of the changes their nations were going through. And although I would say that Mutsuhito was a little bit more hands-on, Victoria, especially after her husband's death, was kind of withdrawn, but she made a lot of cultural contributions to the country that really helped to change things. Now, the other thing that was kind of a similar parallel is that their successors both had very short reigns. In Victoria's case, her son Edward uh, reigned 1901 to 1910. In Mutsuhito's uh, situation, his son, uh, Yoshihito, who ruled from 1912 to 1926. Both cases, the second era, the succeeding era, is so much like the first that we often think of them as being the same thing. And in the case of Yoshihito, his era was called Taisho, which means great righteousness. But again, you know, the, the clothing styles, the technology, a lot of that, the great change was still going on. So we can often kind of consider them to be the same thing although a Japan expert or a Japanese would certainly correct me on that. So how did Japan end up coming out of its long isolation? Admiral Matthew Perry, <laughs> an American. An American who was sent on an expedition to open up Japan because the Western nations were making lots of money trading with China at the time. China was weak and they couldn't really resist. Uh, so the Westerners wrote their own rules. And in Japan, they said, oh, it's not fair. We want to trade with them, too. So the Americans sent this gunboat, basically a group of gunboats, that said, open up or else. We're going to talk to the emperor or the shogun or whoever's in charge here. And essentially, the Japanese realized, uh-oh, we've been isolated for 200 years and we've fallen behind. They used to be ahead of everybody else. I mean, they were pioneers in metallurgy and chemistry and things like that. And, you know, agricultural techniques. Now, the West had greatly surpassed them. And they knew there was no way they could resist uh, this, even these few gunboats. And they were basically obliged to sign these horribly unequal treaties. So there was a lot of dissatisfaction among the feudal lords. Uh, the daimyo class, you know, as they called them. And an alliance of three of these from the south, from the traditional part of Japan, uh, Satsuma, the Chosu, and the Tosa, they banded together 
uh, raise an army and and marched on Edo, which is where the Tokugawa had his headquarters. I'm kind of simplifying it here, but essentially they said, we want change. You must resign. And uh, the emperor has got to take control again because we need to be unified in the face of these foreigners. They had a, a very young shogun at the time, and they had a very powerful chief minister who was kind of really running things, who died suddenly. Hmm, maybe poisoning. <laughs> That's what they always suspected. And a new guy came in as his advisor, Yoshinobu, and Yoshinobu suddenly became shogun when the young shogun suddenly died unexpectedly. Hmm. Wikipedia said it was natural causes, but you never know. Anyway, so once he was in charge, he was out of his depth. And he said, okay, well, there's armies at my gates. I guess I better resign. So he did. And they put the emperor, the young Meiji emperor, Mutsuhito, in charge for real. And he decided to move his capital from Kyoto, where it had been for centuries, to Edo in the east. Uh, it, the word Edo meant gateway, as in, you know, the bay that it was situated on. And he renamed it Tokyo, eastern capital. Yeah, so Tokyo has only been Tokyo for the, like, since the 1800s. Anyway, so that rebellion over, there was still a lot of turbulence and a lot of trouble and various rebellions when people were unhappy with the way things were going. And that was one of the things that Saiga was involved in. He was kind of a figure in the Meiji government, but he was also opposing the Meiji government and ended up dying in a rebellion. But he's still considered a national hero. So anyway, like I said, it was a time of political upheaval. The Tokugawa shogunate had, had ruled for hundreds of years, and the country had been isolated for over two centuries. And this was part of, or the end of, the Edo period, when the actual rulers were in Edo. Some of the many things that the new emperor and his advisors initiated were military reform. They decided they needed a national army and navy. Because before they just had, each lord had his own military force. Land reform, give the peasants their own land. And to abolish, well, first they weakened them and then they abolished them, the samurai class. And, you know, which was kind of sad in a way because they took away their swords and their distinctive haircuts. They were supposed to uh, look Western from now on. And that's kind of unfortunate from, you know, from a Western samurai aficionado standpoint. They started being imperialistic, kind of copying England almost. They uh, annexed the island of Hokkaido to the north, which is now part of Japan. Uh, they took part of Sakhalin, even further north, which is now in Russia. Uh, some of the Kuril Islands, also Russian. They annexed the Ryokus, which is where Okinawa is, uh, who, which had been an independent kingdom. And for a time, they even attacked and ruled Korea and Taiwan. But this came a little later. But this all started around that time. Now, one of the cool terms that Ravina uses to ex explain this era is radical traditionalism. <laughs> a very cool kind of self-contradictory term. What that means is you reach way back in the past and you say, look at this glorious past. We're going to go back to that. But what you're really doing is changing everything. And that's what the Japanese did. Now, it'd be like the Europeans saying, well, we love the Roman Empire. Let's bring it back. <laughs> and in reality, it would be totally different than the actual Roman Empire. Another cool term he used was cosmopolitan chauvinism, which essentially meant we don't want to be these isolated backwater hicks anymore. We want to be sophisticated like the English, like the Americans, you know. We want to be internationalists. So it means kind of like you're looking down on the rubes. <laughs> and so, as I said, they abolished the samurai class, and the new army consisted of both samurai and peasants. They instituted public education throughout the country. They standardized the language. In school, you were supposed to learn the Tokyo dialect, essentially. They said, let's dress like Westerners. <laughs> and so in fiction from this era, you see, you see about half the people wearing Western dresses, at least half the men, 
A lot of them still were traditional. A lot of the women looked traditional, but some, you know, looked Victorian. <laughs> we want Western ha hairstyles. We don't want that shaved on the front and the ponytail on the back look anymore. And we want Western marriage. No more polygamy. Sorry, guys. And we want equality for the untouchable caste, which were the people who did like slaughterhouses and tanneries. And a lot of people said, oh, no, these horrible people? The emperor said, yes, they are people too. You must respect them. So good for him. <laughs> One sad thing is that they, they went after a lot of their tradition. And uh, they dismantled some of the wonderful feudal castles they had. Although they did save a few, thankfully. Another thing was some attacks on Buddhism, unfortunately. They called it Shinbutsu Bunri, which means separation. Uh, because Buddhism is a foreign religion. It came from India. We want to go back to our pagan ways of Shinto, which had always been there, but they'd kind of combined. It's kind of the way, like the way that Europeans combined their, their native paganism with Roman Catholicism. And a lot of the saints rep represented old deities. Well, you, it would be like the Europeans saying, down with Christianity, we're going to go back to worshiping Thor. <laughs> and so, unfortunately, a lot of Buddhist temples got destroyed. Not all of them, but a lot of them did. Technological progress. It was a big time for that. They had to catch up with the West. And it would be some time before they could start to innovate again, you know, in, as we know in electronics, etc. They brought in a lot of foreigners to consult, to teach them the, the stuff. But of course, they weren't allowed to stay because Japan always wants to stay Japanese. They created heavy industry. They mined coal and iron and they created iron mills, you know, iron smelters where they were making iron and uh, building ships and uh, textile mills instead of doing it by hand so they could export silk and make a lot of money. They built railroads throughout the country, just like in Great Britain, tied the country together. And as in Britain, there was a lot of migration from the countryside to the big cities where people would work in factories. So totally revolutionary era, kind of an echo a lot of England, a lot of Britain. And, you know, it's hopeful that we'll see more anime that takes place in this era. And you can do a lot of fun, kind of fanciful steampunkish things in them. The most ideal, in my view, is Apari Ranman, <laughs> uh, which is about a Japanese inventor who's got this cool steam car and, and cool airship and all this stuff, and his samurai buddy that travel to America to take place in this great race. This is about 1900, so they're going to cross the United States at a time when there aren't roads across the country, which is pretty cool. It's a pretty cool series. So that is kind of the ideal. I hope we'll see more of that. We do see some cool uh, historical stuff from that time, from the Meiji and Taisho eras, including, like I said, the very popular Demon Slayer. And hopefully we'll see some more. You know, if you see the mixture of Western dress and traditional dress and steam locomotives, you know you're in the right place. <laughs> Japanese age of steam. Anyway, this has been my video on the Meiji Restoration, the Japanese Age of Steam, Steampunk Japan. Please let me know what you think about that in the comments. Please like and subscribe and also check out my books on Amazon. The links, as always, are in the description. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.